broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Loretta Byrne, and I am the program manager of researchmatch.org. Welcome, and thank you all for attending today's bro uh, broadcast, uh, Using Positive Activities to Combat Anxiety and Depression. Offered in collaboration with our featured presenters, Dr. Charles Taylor from the University of California, San Diego, and the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. ResearchMatch.org is an online matching service that facilitates customized matching of participants like you and me with medical research studies. We're very glad that you're part of this work. I'm joined today by my colleague, Leslie Boone. Leslie is the project manager here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and within her role as a project manager, she works with Research Match and she creates opportunities to share results of research studies like this with the public. The information and statements expressed on this webinar are not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. So um, viewers like you should seek their own professional counsel uh, for any medical condition or before altering any existing care plan. After today's presentation, we'll open up the program for your questions. And I now have the pleasure of turning over the presentation to Leslie Boone, who will introduce you to our presenters for today's programs. Thank you, Loretta. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad you're here. We have two presenters today, and the first one is Dr. Charles, Charles Taylor. He is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Diego and the director of the Positive Emotion and Anxiety Research Laboratory that's called PEARL. His research seeks to understand the role of both positive and negative emotions in the maintenance maintenance and treatment of anxiety and depressive disorders. The goal of this work is to translate study findings to enhance social and emotional well-being, in addition to reducing symptoms. Dr. Taylor's program of work is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. He has over 15 years of experience in evidence-based treatment approaches for anxiety and depression. Dr. Taylor serves on the editorial board of the ADAA's flagship journal, Depression and Anxiety, and helped establish the partnership between the ADAA and Research Match. Our second presenter um, will be Dr. Deborah Keeson. Dr. Keeson is the executive director of Light on Anxiety Treatment Center, um, which is a CBT treatment center. She specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and related disorders. She is the author of the Panic Workbook for Teens and is an active contributor to the Huffington Post and shares information on empir empirically supported treatment for anxiety and related disorders. She also has a special interest in the principles of mindfulness and their application for anxiety disorders. Dr. Keeson has presented her research on CBT and mindfulness-based treatments for anxiety and related disorders at regional and national conferences. She is the co-chair of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America's Public Education Committee and was the recipient of the 2018 Anxiety Depression Association of America's Distinction Award and is a clinical fellow with this organization. She is a media psychologist and is available for press inquiries. At this time, we'll hear from Dr. Taylor. Great, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking with you all today and would like to thank Research Match for creating what I think is a very unique and important opportunity to share with you the Research Match volunteer community findings from a research study where we've been evaluating a new treatment approach for anxiety and depression. So I'd like to begin by providing an overview of what I'll be talking about today. So I'll first begin talking about uh, giving you some background on anxiety and depressive disorders and why these health conditions are important to study, why it's important to develop a better understanding of these conditions with the goal of developing more effective treatments. I'll then discuss the role of both positive and negative emotions in anxiety and depression, considering how our current treatments address these emotions and related domains of functioning. 
I'll then review what we know about positive emotions and why they're beneficial for us and how they may be helpful in combating anxiety and depression. I'll then describe our positive activities intervention study, walking you through what it would look like to be a participant in that study and presenting some of our study findings. I'll then end with a brief summary of what we found before turning things over to my colleague from the ADA, Dr. Kissy. So I'd like to begin with talking about why anxiety and depressive disorders are important health conditions to study. Well, what we know is that anxiety and depressive disorders are very common mental health conditions. One in four people at some point in their lifetime will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder, and about one in six people at some point in their lifetime will meet criteria for major depressive disorder. And I'd like to clarify that although most everyone will experience feelings of anxiety and depression from time to time, for example, when confronted with situations that we may feel are threatening or concerning to us, or where we've experienced a loss, what I'm talking about here are times when those feelings persist, when they're frequent and intense, and they cause some sort of disruption in a person's life. That's what we're talking about here with anxiety and depressive disorders. These conditions often occur together. It's, it's actually very common if people have a particular anxiety disorder that they also experience elevated symptoms of depression. They may meet criteria for major depressive disorder. And these condi conditions are highly distressing and disruptive. They interfere with our relationships, with uh, developing friendships or maintaining friendships, our family relationships. They may make it difficult for us to perform well at work or school and it may interrupt our daily activities. And importantly, anxiety and depressive disorders, they diminish quality of life. They diminish life satisfaction. So it's really, really important to better understand these conditions with the goal of developing better treatments. So I'd now like to talk a little bit about how we can understand anxiety and depressive disorders from the perspective of both positive and negative emotions. So when you think about anxiety and depressive disorders, what are the, some of the first things that come to mind? Well, you're probably thinking about things like feelings of sadness or feeling down, symptoms of anxiety or fearfulness. Um, people with anxiety and depression often report irritability, maybe feelings of shame or guilt. Um, these emotions are associated with negative thought thinking patterns, things like I'm not good enough, um, worries about the future, something bad is gonna happen, what if I make a mistake? What if things don't go well? What if he or she doesn't like me? And these thoughts and emotions lead us to want to avoid things. We pull away from things, right? We may avoid things that we perceive are threatening or won't turn out well. We may start to isolate ourselves. And what we know is that these symptoms are very, very common. And as a result, our existing treatments have focused on targeting these particular dimensions. So if any of you have ever sought treatment for anxiety or depression before, you may have spoken with your therapist about things like identifying negative thinking patterns and coming up with more helpful ways to, to think about uh, situations that you were perceiving negatively. Or maybe you've been asked to confront situations you've been avoiding to tolerate negative emotions like fear and anxiety. And the emphasis of these existing treatments is on reducing heightened negativity. And what we know is that these treatments are really, really good for reducing symptoms and reducing heightened negativity. And Dr. Kissin will uh, point you to some resources on the ADA's website that will tell you more about treatment approaches for anxiety and depressive disorders that are supported by research. However, what we've come to learn over the years is that heightened negativity is only part of the story. There are other symptoms that go along with anxiety and depression, things like diminished interest or participation in activities that were once meaningful. So it's not that you're actively avoiding activities, but you just don't have the motivation or the interest in pursuing them anymore. Sometimes people will say that they just don't enjoy the things that they used to enjoy. Uh, leisure activities, spending time with other people in their lives, they just don't get the same pleasant feelings out of those situations anymore. Sometimes people with anxiety or depression report feeling cut off or disconnected from other people. It's difficult for them to feel have loving or caring feelings um, or difficulty experiencing positive emotions. And so what we've learned 
is that anxiety and depressive disorders are also characterized by diminished positivity. So putting this all together, the picture of anxiety and depression looks something like this. A combination of both heightened negativity as well as diminished positivity. And what we know from research is that at the level of our biology, our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, our negative experiences are at least somewhat separate from our positive experiences. They're not just mere opposites. And this is important because what it means is that if I know something or you tell me something about how negative you're feeling or how negative you're not feeling, I won't know for certain how positive you're feeling. You may not be feeling all that negative, but you may be feeling um, all that, not that uh, positive either. And this distinction is important because we're starting to discover that our existing treatments that focus on reducing heightened negativity, that they don't work quite as well for improving positive uh, emotions and domains of functioning. So in a sense, our current treatments do a very good job at repairing negative emotions and symptoms of anxiety and depression, but they fall short in repairing or restoring positive emotions and functioning. So I think it's important to really consider well, why should we enhance positive emotions, right? Is there anything that positive emotions may do for us other than just making us feel good? And this is a question that scientists have been investigating for quite some time now. So we actually know that positive emotions can be helpful in a number of different ways. One way is that positive emotions help people bounce back from negative emotions that are induced by stressful situations. For instance, the negative emotions, they disappear more quickly or they don't have as quite as much of an impact on us. And you can imagine that this could be really useful for combating anxiety and depression where negative emotions and experiences are common. We also know that positive emotions help connect people together. They motivate us to seek out social interactions. For instance, we tend to be more social when we're feeling positive. And when we feel positive emotions during our social interactions, we feel a sense of a connection and a desire to seek those people out again and to interact with them more. And we know that our social relationships are really, really important for making us feel good and supporting us during times of need. We also know that positive emotions are very important for contributing to our sense of, of how well our life is going, our sense of satisfaction and well-being. In fact, the presence of positive emotions has been shown to be about carry about twice as much weight in our judgments of our life satisfaction and well-being compared to the absence of negative emotions. I think even more important is when you ask people that are seeking treatment, they're about to receive treatment for an anxiety or depressive disorder, and we ask them, what's important to you? How do you know when you've recovered? What they tell us is the presence of positive emotions and positive facets of their life, things like life satisfaction and meaning, are the most important for recovery. So I think it's something that we really, really need to, to pay attention to. And as I alluded to with that figure before, the absence of negative does not equal the presence of positive. And again, we know that our current treatments that do a really, really good job of reducing heightened negativity, they don't do quite as well at restoring positivity. So I'd now like to talk a little bit about the specific study that um, we conducted that focused on developing and testing a positive activity intervention for anxiety and depressive disorders. So I'd like to begin with talking about what are positive activities. So, you know, for a long time, people thought that the question whether it was possible to increase positive emotions, people thought, well, maybe it's because of my genetics, what I come into this world with, maybe it's because of my life circumstances. And those are things that really determine my level of, of positive emotions and well-being. And while those factors are indeed true, what research now demonstrates is that there are things that we can do to increase positive emotions. These are simple, intentional, and repeated practice uh, practices, things like counting your blessings, performing acts of kindness for others, or maybe stopping and savoring a positive moment and taking it all in. And what we know from years worth of research in the general community is that positive activities are supported by research. 
they're helpful at increasing levels of positive emotion and well-being. So one question that we don't know, though, is how can these positive activities be used to help people with anxiety and depressive disorders? And that was really the goal of this particular study. So what we did is we developed a positive activity intervention. And the goal of this intervention was to help people increase their experiences of positive emotions. And what I think is really important to understand and what we tell people when they start this program is the goal of this program is not to deny the experience of negative emotions and experiences, right? Or to say that negative emotions and stressful things don't happen. What the goal is, is to help people understand and to try to create more room, more space in their lives for positive emotions and positive experiences so that those things can be helpful when we're feeling stressed out, when we're dealing with negative life events or other things in our lives. That's, that's really the goal of the program. What the structure of the program looks like, there are 10 treatment sessions and people come into our clinic for one hour a week and they meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our clinicians. And each session follows a general structure. So what we do is we first introduce a particular positive activity. And we talk about why that particular activity works. Right? What is the science behind that activity? Why might that be helpful for combating anxiety and depression, helping us uh, connect with important and meaningful things in our lives? We then discuss the specific activity and how do you implement the activity and we help people develop a, a really a personalized plan where that person can implement that activity throughout the work. So we set up a game plan for that. What happens then is that people then will take that activity home with them and they'll implement it throughout the week into their daily lives. When they come in the next session, they review what they found in the context of that activity. What did they do? What did they notice? How did they feel about it? Um, what was that like for them? And then they'll build on that and they'll learn uh, new activities each session. And really our goal here is we wanna uh, emphasize person activity fit. So what we tell people is that not all activities might be a great fit for you. Some are gonna be better than others. We encourage people to be open and curious to try the activities out and then to really think about which activities best fit for them. Uh, and to think about variety, mixing things up, um, trying different things out is very, very important. And the way we think about this is that really this is about learning new skills, right? So just if you were to learn how to play the piano, for instance, you attend piano lessons once a week, and what you do in between the lessons is really, really important, right? The practice that you put in the hours and the time, and that's really how we conceptualize this particular treatment program. So I'd just like to give you an idea of what these intervention exercises look like. So we tested out a number of different positive activities, and the positive activities can sort of be thought of you know, as, as falling into some categories. For instance, one set of activities really encourages people to notice, to take part in, and to make the most out of positive events, right? So things like living this month like it's your last in this area, really taking notice and engaging activities that are important and savoring them and making the most of them. Um, we also found that other activities focus on engaging in kind or generous acts directed toward other people. Things like acts of kindness or making somebody else happier. And finally, some activities focus on creating a more positive outlook on ourselves or on our lives and our future. Things like gratitude, identifying and using our strengths, um, and cultivating optimism. And the goal is by the end of the program is for people to identify the activities that are the best fit for them to personalize those activities with the aim of creating a long-term plan for continuing to build their new positivity skills. So what I'd like you to do, uh, to do now is to walk you through the experience of a participant or of a volunteer in this particular study. So what would this look like if you were to take part in the study? So the first thing that happens is there's an exchange of information, right? So you, the volunteer, you first learn about the study. Maybe you, you saw, uh, you received an email from Research Match, and Research Match thought maybe you'd be a good match for this study. And you you read a blurb a little bit about what we're doing. And you say, this sounds interesting. Yes, I'm interested in the study. What happens at that point is one of our um, research personnel will contact you. Uh, what happens then is you'll receive more information about the study on the phone. If you have any questions, those questions will be answered. 
And then we'll ask you some brief questions to determine study fit. We want to make sure that the study is likely to be a good fit for you before inviting you to come in and spending time meeting with us and uh, learning more about that. At that stage of the game, we schedule a session here at UCSD in our research clinic. And there you learn even more details about the study. Right? This is part of the informed consent process. We really want people to have a full understanding of what they're getting into before they agree to take part in the study. And then you'd answer more questions. You'd do some questionnaires and you'd meet with one of our clinicians and they'd ask you some questions about your health symptoms, your symptoms of anxiety and depression, your treatment history, to make sure that the study is a good fit for what's going on for you. And sometimes people will say, well, why, why are there specific criteria for study? Why, why, um, why do you ask these sorts of questions? Well, we first of all wanna make sure that again, that the program that we're testing is likely to be a good fit and then we also want to make sure that we can really um, determine the effect of the program and make conclusions about the program. So for instance, one of the common things that comes up is that people may have started a medication recently, or maybe they're interested in pursuing treatment and they also have an appointment or started therapy with another clinician. And if that was to happen, we wouldn't necessarily know that any changes that we see on what we're measuring, so for instance, changes in symptoms, we don't know if it has anything to do with our program or the new medication or treatment. And so that's why we have specific entry criteria. Now, if people meet the entry criteria and they make the decision that they'd like to participate, they're then officially enrolled in the study. Then what happens is we collect a whole bunch of information about you related to our study hypotheses, related to what we're trying to understand and find out about our program. So you'd come back to UCSD. And we'd have you fill out a number of different questionnaires. And these are some of the questionnaires that are measuring some of the things that we think are important um, uh, aspects or things that will change as a result of the program. So you'd be asking questions about your emotions, both positive and negative emotions. We'd say, during the past week, to what extent have you felt interested or enthusiastic, distressed, nervous, or irritable? We also ask you questions about generally how satisfied are you with your life, right? So, so well-being. We also asked some questions focused on that negative domain, so symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we'd ask things like, over the past two weeks, how often have you been feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Or how often have you felt anxious or have you avoided situations because of your anxiety or fear? We also invite you to come back for another session. It's a brain imaging session. And I'm not gonna talk too much about that today. Um, but what the cool part of this is that people receive a picture of their brain at the end of the study. So it's kind of a, a nice bonus for taking part in the study. Then what happens after we've collected all of that information on people, we're ready to administer the treatment conditions, right? And here we have two treatment conditions. We have people that are assigned to the positive activity intervention. So they do those 10 positive treatment activity sessions or to a control group. And in this case, the control group was delayed treatment. So what that means is that people just waited for 10 weeks before they started the intervention. And the reason it's important to have a control group is so that we can measure changes and compare changes in the treatment group to changes in some other sort of control group. And in this case, we're just really um, controlling for things like doing this, the assessments multiple times and just for the passage of time. And so if you're, at the, so the assignment is random. It's essentially like flipping a coin. We wanna make sure that about equal numbers of people um, have an equal chance of being assigned to either of those two treatment conditions. And if you're assigned to the immediate treatment, you then start the program. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through a sample treatment session. So for instance, if the session was about acts of kindness, we'd start by presenting why acts of kindness are important, why they might be helpful for anxiety and depression. So we'd say things like, well, acts of kindness refocus our attention on other people. And that can be helpful because it interrupts that negative cycle of self-focus, right? The dwelling on our negative thoughts about ourselves and about our future it interrupts that cycle. Acts of kindness may help us increase our connection with other people or, or our community. And we may even see the positive impact of our kind acts on others. Once we've provided that rationale, we then assign the activity. So this activity is uh, people are asked to engage in up to five kind acts all in one day. And they're asked to record what they did and how they felt while they were doing the exercises. 
So the next session, then that person would come in and we'd review with them what they did and what they, how they felt about the activity. So here's an example, sort of a mix of different acts of kindness. Here's somebody that spent some extra time to help someone on a school project. They picked up trash at the beach with their kids, um, bought their coworker a favorite tea. And what we do is we review the activity and we ask them and say, well, what did you learn? Were there any sort of insights or things that you learned as a result of that? And again, we're really here emphasizing person activity fit and variety so that people can continue building on on these things and implementing them into their, their daily lives. So then what happens at the end of those 10 sessions or after the end of the 10 weeks of waiting period in the control group, people return to UCSD and we recollect all the information on them that we collected at the beginning of the study. So people redo the questionnaires again, they redo the brain imaging assessment. And the goal is to really look at and to see how people changed, if at all, on these different assessments. Then what happens is that if you were in the immediate treatment group, so you received treatment during those 10 weeks, we contact you three and six months later to complete questionnaires. And the goal here is to see any sort of changes that we saw immediately after the treatment, what happens several months later. So once we discontinue the intervention, we hope people continue working on the activities, what happens to symptoms and our other outcomes. The people that were in the delayed treatment group, we offer them the, the positive activity intervention, and then the study participation ends. So in this particular study, I'm gonna show you some results. And in this study, we had 29 individuals with impairing anxiety or depression. So again, these are symptoms that were causing some degree of disruption in the person's life. Most of these folks had actually received some sort of previous treatment for anxiety or depression before. And again, consistent with our interest in measuring positive and, and negative domains of functioning, we were interested in examining changes in things like positive emotions, satisfaction with life, and things like negative emotions and symptoms of anxiety and depression. So what did we find? So let me first orient you to this particular figure right here. Now, if you look at the, the vertical, the up and down line there, where it says positive emotions, what that represents is people's levels of positive emotions. So higher means uh, more intense, more frequent positive emotions. If you look along the horizontal line, right to left, you'll see these are basically the time points when we've collected that, that information. So we collect information on people's level of positive emotions before treatment, before anything's happened, immediately after treatment, or after that 10 week waiting period in the control group. And then again, in the positive activity uh, immediate group, we assess three and six months later. And what that green dotted line represents is that that's the level of positive emotions of people that were sampled in the general community. So really what that means is that when this particular measure was administered to thousands and thousands of people, randomly selected people in the general community uh, in the United States, this is the average level of positive emotions that people so that's sort of one of our benchmarks of, of where we know where people stand. So here's what we found. So if you look at before treatment, you can see that our participants, as we'd expect, had diminished positive emotions. They had very low levels of positive emotions and actually quite lower than the general community. What we find is that after treatment, people in the positive activity group had a significant increase in positive emotions to a point that they were on par or similar to other people in the general population. And those changes persisted over the course of three and six months later. So those findings are really encouraging because they show that maybe this intervention, at least for these people, helped restore positive emotions to similar levels of what you see in the general population. And what we found is the exact same thing when we looked at uh, our measures of life satisfaction and social connectedness or other measures of positive function. So what about negative emotions? So I talked a little bit about how positive activities may be helpful for negative emotions. And these are the things that often we think about with anxiety and depression. So the only difference here is that in this particular figure, we're, we're aiming for lower negative emotions. So that's where that, again, that line um, is represented. So what you can see here is that before people start treatment, not surprisingly, they experience a lot of negative emotions, much more than people in the general community. And again, after people received the positive activity intervention, they had a significant reduction in symptom, uh, negative emotions and symptoms 
to a level comparable to the general population. And those changes again persisted through the follow-up period. And we found the exact same thing for reductions in anxiety and depression symptoms. So these were really, really encouraging findings. So what I'd like to do is just briefly summarize what we found. So again, in this particular study, we found that the positive activity intervention, it increased positive emotions and aspects of functioning to a degree on par with people in the general population. It also decreased negative emotions and symptoms of anxiety and depression. These changes were lasting up to six months later when we assessed people. And so the conclusion is that positive activities may be beneficial for combating anxiety and depression and may help restore positive domains of functioning. So I'd just like to conclude briefly by sort of wrapping this all together and thinking about the role of research match, volunteers, and the ADAA in research like this. So really what this research project began as is an idea. I had an idea. And in order to conduct a research study, it tends to, you need some degree of resources. You often need funding. And so I pitched this idea to the UC San Diego Clinical and Translational Research Institute. They have a program where they will offer some degree of funding to help support initial research ideas. Once I received that funding, um, I was connected with Research Match. One of the biggest challenges in conducting research is to enroll participants, is to find and to get people engaged in the program to test your research question out. And that's where Research Match comes in. I was connected with Research Match. They were a fantastic resource. And several people from Research Match, several volunteers, ended up in this study. Then Research Match, I, 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 they talked about developing partnerships with organizations that uh, whose mission it is is to promote information about particular health related conditions and so i connected them with the anxiety and depression association of america which again dr kissen will tell you a little bit more about and i think what's really important to remember here is that the center of all of this is you the volunteers that research and and science cannot happen without the volunteers and so the way that i think about this is that science informed advances in health cannot happen without volunteers it cannot happen without you so I know from, from me and from all of my other uh, fellow colleagues, we thank you very much. So I'd just like to end um, by thanking all of the many people that uh, helped make this research possible. Of course, our volunteers, collaborators, and research personnel, and of course, the funding agencies that helped make this possible. Um, just like to let people know that uh, findings from the study were published here in the uh, Journal of Depression and Anxiety. And I'd just like to end with some resources uh, that people may find helpful. Um, and again, Dr. Kisson will talk more about that. So thank you very, very much for giving me this, I think, again, very unique and important opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for that informative information. Um, we'll now hear from Dr. Deborah Keeson to learn more about the resources offered by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions, please um, type them into the um, chat box, and we will uh, get to your questions or concerns later on in this program. Thank you. Dr. Kisson? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, thank you for having me and I'm happy to represent the Anxiety Depression Association of America for this great webinar. My name is Dr. Deborah Kisson. I'm the clinical director of the Light on Anxiety Treatment Center and we're here in Chicago and offer CBT-based treatment for anxiety and related disorders. And I also really value my role as the uh, co-chair of the Public Education Committee of the Anxiety Depression Associ Association of America. And so moving forward for this webinar, I'll be saying ADAA, since that's easier to get out of my mouth. And ADAA is delighted to be collaborating with Research Match on this webinar, and we look forward to working together on future projects. So hopefully this is just the beginning. And I'd like to spend a few minutes letting the attendees who are here with us today know a little more about ADAA, our mission, the communities that we work with, and resources that ADA has available that hopefully 
will be of assistance to those who are joining us today. So a little bit about who ADA is. ADA is an international nonprofit organization with over 1,800 mental health professionals and is a, leading, is a leader in education, training, and research for anxiety, depression, and related disorders. ADA focuses on improving quality of life for individuals and families struggling with anxiety and depression. Every day, ADA staff and our members work tirelessly to educate the public about the latest research and treatment options, bringing together the greatest minds in the field, such as Dr. Taylor here with us today, to raise awareness, working towards wellness and finding cures. A little more about ADAA. ADA's unique interlinked consumer and professional mission focuses on improving the quality of life for those with anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD, and co-occurring disorders through education, practice, and research. ADA provides free educational resources through blogs, webinars, podcasts, videos, articles, and more. And so I, I highly recommend that those in attendance today check out the ADA we, website. There's so many resources that members have put together to share tips and tools to assist in moving past anxiety and depression related disorders. And on average, we have 30 million visitors coming to the ADA website a year, and we're always looking for more who want to join us there. So at the from the ADA website, you'll find free webinars, podcasts, blog posts, hosted or written by mental health professionals who specialize in the treatment of anxiety and depression, free e-newsletters, highlighting relevant articles and free resources on anxiety, depression, and co-occurring disorders. ADA also creates and offers infographics on a variety of topics. These are visually engaging and fun tools that convey information about mental health, and the infographics are available for download on the ADA, ADAA website. Also, you'll find there a variety of brochures that, that are also free to download, as well as recommendations for self-help books on anxiety and depression and co-occurring disorders written by members of ADAA. And another great resource, as I mentioned, I'm here in Chicago, and I often get emails and calls from mental health consumers all over the country looking for high-quality providers that specialize in empirically supported treatment approaches to help move past different mental health concerns. And so from the ADA website, you'll find access to the Find a Therapist list. And from here, there's over 900 licensed mental health providers listed in the, in the directory. And they're all professional members of ADAA who've chosen to be included in the database. And this database can be searched by geographic location of disorder. Many ADA members also offer telemental health services. Counseling offered over the internet, through email, video conferencing, online chat, via phone, really looking for lots of different ways to help get the right information to the right people, especially those who cannot leave their home or work during unconventional hours or maybe live in rural or more remote areas. And from one other new and really nice offering through ADAA is the anonymous peer-to-peer -peer online anxiety and depression support groups. And we now have over 20,000 subscribers all around the world that are active participants. And these are friendly, safe, supportive places for individuals and families to share information and experiences. ADA also has a vibrant and active social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram that engages both consumers and professional communities. And we would love to in connect with you in these different mediums as well. ADA receives numerous personal stories of triumph every year from our public community. And it's always great to share this information and learn how others have moved past their challenges and what recommendations they have. And for others who really understand what you might be struggling with, knowing that there is hope to move forward. And as mentioned, we have a really active professional community that has many resources that bring together some of the best minds 
Um, and so finally, just wrapping up a little more information on, on ADAA, um, we really just want to thank you for taking the time to learn about our organization and how hopefully we can serve you. And we want to thank Research Match for this opportunity to share information about ADA. And I encourage you to visit the website to learn more about the work that we do and how you might become more involved with our communities. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Keeson, for providing that valuable information about the ADAA and those resources that are available to the public. Um, now it's the time for a um, question and answer portion of our program. Um, today's questions will be taken from the web participants. So for everyone's benefit, please keep your questions without any personal details so we can provide an answer that is general in nature. And in the interest of time, I also ask that you keep your questions related to the topic of the study presented and the information about ADAA's resources. Um, so to ask a question, please use the um, chat box that's on your screen. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Leah Dunkel, who will tell us the first question. Leah? Thank you so much, Leslie. Muted. Oh. Unmuted. So our first question is, um, I'm curious about the medically supervised positive activities or what these looked like. So did they occur in the clinic setting or at home or both? And I believe this is a question for you, Dr. Taylor. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the activities themselves were first presented to participants in uh, our clinical research setting, so one-on-one -on -one with our therapist, and then the uh, participant engaged in those activities over the course of the week. So for instance, what happened is, again, with the acts of kindness example, is that uh, a plan was developed in session. So you, you, know, you talk with the participant and say, well, what are some acts of kindness that you may be able to do this week? And you start to develop a plan and you say, okay, is there a particular day this week that you may be able to engage in those activities? And you say, oh yes, you know, Friday's a good day for that. And then the participant takes those, that uh, assignment home with them and engages in those activities um, between the sessions. They then come back in the next week and they review what happened, what they found out, what, what they did, what their experiences were. Thank you for that. And so our next question is from Terry, and that's, has this been developed or is it being developed into a treatment regimen available generally, especially in non-university locations? Uh, that is also an excellent question, and that is the hope that we will be able to do that. Um, as you probably could tell from the initial findings I presented, this intervention is still in the early phases of testing out. So the goal is that we wanna really make sure that these findings replicate. We are very encouraged by what we found, but before we um, make this publicly available or um, you know, write books and things like that on it, we wanna make sure that again, that what we're doing here um, is supported by research and, and if we have to make any modifications to the program that we're going to be able to do that. Um, so that's the goal one day, um, but those but this particular intervention is not currently uh, publicly available. Great, thank you for that. And so I think we do have a question either for Dr. Taylor or Dr. Kisson, which is um, about where you can find more information about anxiety and depression. Well, I'm happy to jump in. Can you can you guys hear me? I unmuted myself. Yes, we can. Okay. So, you know, there there's so much. I think seldom is the problem that there isn't enough information about anxiety and depression. I think the challenge of sorting through from all the information out there to find kind of the quality information. And unfortunately, with many of the clients who come to us, there's there's some pretty scary and or unhelpful information if you're just kind of Googling your way through trying to diagnose yourself or find ways to get treatment. So as I keep plugging the ADA website, everything that's posted on there links to suggested workbooks. And there's so many great workbooks to get started as well. They've all been reviewed and assessed to make sure it's high quality information. So I'd say start with a high quality 
information source such as ADAA, and you'll find plenty of information. And the key is to just not get yourself so overwhelmed in the process of getting through that information that you feel kind of stuck. And so sometimes reviewing that information with your primary care physician, if you don't have a therapist, it's nice to speak out loud with another person and not just kind of go at it alone would be a recommendation. Thank you so much for that. And so we do have another question from Lisa, and I believe this is for Dr. Taylor. Do volunteers represent a different set than other people with anxiety and depression? So for example, they had a level of energy and interest to volunteer that may not be present in people with more severe symptoms. So do you expect similar results in patients assigned this type of therapy? That's a really wonderful question. And I think that question, it, it, it really we should think about that with all research that we do, that the people that take part in research and that take part in these sorts of treatment studies, they may not be fully representative of the folks that we see out in the general community. And a big part of that is motivation. Clearly, the people that signed up for the study, that went through those initial phone calls and that let us um, ask them a whole bunch of different questions so they could take part in the treatment program, uh, they may be more motivated, they may be more engaged than um, other people out in the community. And so the way that we really look at this is when we're, we're developing and we're trying to understand more about a new treatment approach, we sort of want to look at, you know, the best, um, the best or ideal conditions, people who want to do this, they're motivated. And if we find that the program can be helpful for those people, then the next step is we want to start to move a little bit more outside of the research clinic. Well, what happens if you get some people that are less motivated or don't have as much time to do these sorts of things? And that's really the goal, I think, of all research and of all clinical research is that how do you uh, take those findings and take you know, those, uh, the, the initial promising results outside of the research context and into the real world? And so that's something that, you know, we're still in the, the development phase and testing this out, but that would absolutely be the next goal. Um, I will also say though, that there are varying levels of motivation and engagement, even in the people that take part in the study. Um, and that's something that we actually measure because we want to know, does that make a difference, right? And, and, and we hypothesize it would, that if people are less motivated for whatever reason, it could be because of time it could be because of some of the symptoms that they're experiencing. You know, I talked about how a depression, for instance, can really rob us of that motivation that maybe that makes it more difficult for them to engage in the treatment. And if we can understand that more, then we can maybe improve the treatment to help engage people more, to help target those people that may be more representative of the real world. So that's a really, that's a great, great question. Thank you for that, Dr. Taylor. And I do just wanna let everyone um, both on the webinar and joining by phone, know that we will be making the slides available following the webinar. We will send those out to all of our registered attendees and we'll make the recording of the webinar available online. So we have another question. I think this one would be for Loretta. So um, we have someone asking, I get emails from Research Match, but I'm afraid to click yes because I may not want to do the study. So do you have to, do I have to do the study um, that I'm invited to do via email? Uh, hi, Leah. Yeah, this is Loretta. Um, uh, no, there, you're never under uh, any obligation to take part in a study. Um, and if you are ever in a study, um, at, you, can, you can leave the study at any time. Um, that's very important for people to understand. Um, when you get an email from Research Match uh, and it has information like studies like Dr. Taylor conducted, that study is, um, I think your study is now over. Is that right, Dr. Taylor? This study is over, but we are now uh, conducting, we have an ongoing study that's the next step in this line of research, and that is active on Research Match. Okay, great. Um, so if I were to get an email with information about your study, uh, and if I say, yes, I'm interested, I'm only saying, yes, I'm interested in learning more about your study, and then I'm giving you my email and my phone number so you can contact me. It does not mean that you have to, uh, or, or I would have to take part in your study, not at all. Thanks for asking, Leah. Thanks for that, Loretta. And so, Dr. Taylor, I do have another question for you. Um, somewhat, Valerie is wondering, what were the demographics of the participants in your study? Ad adults, adolescents, or both? Mm -hmm. 
And was the anxiety depression diagnosis verified? And was there a level necessary for acceptance to the study? All very wonderful questions. So let me see if I can remember them. So this, uh, so the, the participants were adults, quote unquote, um, that anywhere between ages of 18 to 55 years old. Um, you may be asking, well, why did we not span it out even further? Um, you know, past 55, 55 is not that old. Uh, the reason is, is that one of our uh, main assessments or the measures that we took was brain function, right? So we were interested in looking at how people's brains responded to certain types of positive and negative sorts of cues. Um, because we think that's an important aspect of understanding some of the underlying um, biology that may be relevant to maintaining anxiety and depression and that may be relevant to treatment. And as a result of that, what we know is that people's brains change over time, right? So during adolescence, brains are actually changing quite a bit and also brains start to change as we get a little bit older. And so what we tried to do, at least again, as I uh, related to the other question, is that usually in the first step in research, we try to, um, you know, rule out, uh, you know, other potential variables that may make a difference in our findings. And so, for instance, age, right, younger participants, older participants may make a difference. So our participants were ages 18 to 55. I think the average age was about uh, early 30s. Um, we had, I think, slightly more women in the sample than men. Um, uh, but I think it was 60% to 40%. Um, and in terms of the, the diagnosis, so it was interesting. So we did not require a clinical diagnosis for entry into the study. However, we required that people reported that they had some degree of anxiety or depression that was interfering in their lives. It was causing some disruption. What that meant is that actually every participant did actually meet for a clinical diagnosis of an anxiety or depressive disorder, oftentimes uh, several. And this was verified. We had a, one of our clinicians here do a structured clinical interview where we asked the volunteer, again, a whole bunch of different questions about symptoms of anxiety, different types of anxiety, panic attacks, anxiety in social situations, um, prior traumas, things like that. And we also ask about a number of other different um, types of behaviors or symptoms, things like eating behavior, um, use of drugs and alcohol, things like that. And so we did verify those diagnoses with a clinical interview. And I can't remember if there was another part of that question. I think that was, I think you covered everything. Great. And we do have another question from Angela who's asking, how does someone start doing positive activities? How does somebody start doing them? Okay, so what we did in, at least in our program, I can tell you how, how somebody st uh, would start, is that we provided uh, an orientation to the program. And a big part, that's a really important part of, I think, any treatment, right? And again, Dr. Kissen would, would say the same thing, is to help understand what's involved with the treatment, um, why do we think this particular approach is helpful, what is it designed or intended to do, so that's what we talked a lot about it in that first session. And then what we did is we said, okay, the first approach to the, 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 really the first activity that we thought was important was for people to take notice of positive things in their environment. And for anybody who's experienced anxiety or depression, what we know is that those symptoms do really, really good job of focusing our attention on negative things in our environment. That's what they were designed to do, right? And we may be missing out on positive things, right? Or, or th positive uh, events are very fleeting. They pass us by very quickly. So the first skill, the first thing we have people do is just take notice of positive events in their day-to-day -day life. And we ask them, we say, just note up to one good or positive thing that happened each day, right? And they don't have to be big things. And that's, I think, a really important thing too. It could be very small. Uh, somebody could have smiled at you. Someone held the door open for you. You noticed uh, a beautiful flower by the side of the road. Anything like that um, would count. And so that's really the first skill that we develop. And then once people develop that skill, we help them engage more in, okay, well, how can you make the most out of these uh, positive events, right? Um, this idea, again, that positive experiences tend to 
uh, can go by very quickly. We may pay attention very briefly to them, but then we move on. And so part of that uh, at first activity is getting people to spend time to notice it, uh, to go back and remember, reminisce or think about that particular positive event later, write about it um, so you can go back and remember it later. Um, so that's the, that's basically what we did. And then again, each session, as I, as I um, showed during the presentation, you would work with a clinician to introduce new activities and to develop a plan for working on those. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And Loretta, we do have another question for you. Um, so someone's asking, they haven't gotten an email from Research Match in a while. Um, where else can they find studies that they may be a good fit for? Um, uh, so if you haven't gotten an email from Research Match in a while um, and you are looking for a study, you can find studies uh, on Research Match. If you log in with your username and password uh, and you go to your dashboard, um, you can now start to explore studies that are um, looking for volunteers yourself. Um, and uh, we're showing you some studies that are related to the health conditions that you've told us about and also your um, willingness to uh, travel to be in a study. Um, so uh, you can find those on your dashboard. Um, also, just make sure that you're, if you go back in, you could update your profile and, um, uh, you know, if you've gained weight or uh, if you're willing to um, travel, uh, your willingness to travel has changed, you could update that. Um, but they are now showing on your dashboard too. So thank you very much for, for wanting to be a participant in, in studies. We, we, you're, you're just the most important part of this research experience. Thank you for that, Loretta. And so, um, Leslie, do we have time for one more question? I think we, I think we do. Okay, so yes. we have a question for Dr. Taylor from Molly. She's asking, why is there not a long-term follow-up for the control group? Again, another very, very good question. So um, the reason we did that is we felt that, you know, again, these were people that were enrolled in the study that had um, significant symptoms of anxiety or depression, right? They were very disruptive in their lives. And so we thought that asking people to wait 10 weeks um, without treatment, that that was a reasonable time period. And we did talk to them about other resources at the beginning of treatment. You know, there are other resources out there. Um, if that's something that you'd like to pursue, if you don't want to wait those 10 weeks. Um, but what we felt is that asking people to wait even longer than that um, before administering the treatment, it was just, um, it, it, it didn't make sense. It, it wasn't warranted for this level of, um, uh, of study. And so we felt that it was um, a better option to, to offer people the treatment. Now, we may in the future, for instance, have a control group that actually engages in treatment, you know, and it could be one of the other existing treatments that I mentioned. And in that case, we actually, because people, everybody's getting some degree of active treatment, we would uh, follow up both conditions there because you're right, we would want to compare the groups uh, in the long term to see how, um, how the groups uh, fared in the longer term. So that's a very, very good question. I did, if I can just briefly mention, uh, going back to the question that asked about, are these, is this program publicly available? And I said it wasn't, and that's true, it's not. But there are some, um, some books out there, some, some publicly available readings, for instance, by one of our collaborators, who's on one of the uh, later slides, Sonia Lubomirsky, who has written about these positive activities and has written about them um, in you know, publicly available books, but again, talks about the science behind them. So there is information, uh, publicly available information out there. Um, what's not out there though, is that this specific program that's geared toward anxiety and depressive disorders. So I just wanted to let people know that. Well, I want to thank you all for joining today's webcast. Um, uh, special shout out to Dr. Taylor and Dr. Keeson for um, joining, joining us on this journey to present um, the study um, related to anxiety and depression. We know that this was a topic that was of great interest to our Research Match volunteers and um, the uh, professional associations that are dealing with anxiety and depression. So I want to thank you all for answering today's questions. Um, if there are specific questions for Research Match, you are um, we are available to 
answer your questions to help navigate um, your dashboard and research match. Our email address is info at researchmatch.org or you can visit us at www.researchmatch.org. If you would like to listen to this webcast, we are going to upload it to our YouTube channel. Um, preferably by the end of this week. You can also connect with additional resources through the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So we have reached the end of this webcast. We will uh, hope you all have a great afternoon and we look forward to following up with you at a later time. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank goodbye. you. Yes. Goodbye. Bye-bye.